you for joining today. Yep. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining. Uh, I'm Dawn Hines, the president of the Wharton Alumni Social Impact Club. I'd like to tell you a little bit about the club. Uh, the club was formed to serve alumni who are passionate about using their business skills and networks to affect positive changes around the world in the economic, social, and environmental spheres. We act as a platform to bring information and networking opportunities to Wharton and Penn alumni interested in impact. And we also sir, seek to support our alumni who are working as entrepreneurs, investors, and other actors in this space. Today on Rare Disease Day, we're excited to bring you a fireside chat on this important and little understood topic with two Wharton alumni, event organizer and club board member, Amy Dom, and pharma biopharmaceutical bio executive, Justin Ham. Especially excited and honored to welcome the participation of U.S. Senator Amy Klobuchar. Bouchard. Senator Klobuchar Bouchard is a senior U.S. Senator of Minnesota who's the co-chair of the Rare Disease Caucus in the Senate. Senator Klo Bouchard is well known for being active in the rare disease communities. We're delighted to have her participate in this Wharton Rare Disease event. And I will now turn the mic over to Amy Dom. Amy, thanks so much for organizing this event. Thank you so much, Don. It's such a pleasure. Thank you for opening. Um, I'll be doing the interviewing and then I wanted to introduce Justin Hamm and uh, Leslie Edwin, president of the Cushing Support and Research Foundation. So we're going to um, view the remarks first and then we'll do the introductions. I'm a Wharton MBA grad, WG06, and a WASIC board member. Uh, this event has a lot of personal significance to me as a rare disease patient and advocate. Um, a little over 10 years ago, I personally was diagnosed with Cushing syndrome, which is a rare disease, and uh, which is very much in the news these days because of Amy Schumer. So um, let's watch the remarks by um, Senator Klobuchar, and then I'll introduce, I'll have Justin and Leslie introduce themselves. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Hello to everyone tuning in to the Wharton Alum Social Impact Club's Rare Disease Day discussion. Thank you all for everything you do. For more than 140 years, Wharton students and alums have been at the forefront of innovation in business, yes, but also in tech, media, healthcare, and more. I know you're bringing that ingenuity to the fight against rare diseases. As co-chair of the bipartisan, bicameral, Rare Disease Caucus, I know my colleagues and I are thankful for your advocacy on behalf of patients. As we work to end rare diseases as we know them, I see three avenues for action. Number one is medical research. Wharton alums know firsthand that research has the power to shift paradigms in the business world, and the same goes for rare disease treatments. Think about the potential for AI, as long as we have the right guardrails. Um, having just had dinner with the head of Mayo Clinic, Dr. Faruja, uh, who's leading one of the efforts nationally on this, uh, there are some incredible opportunities, especially when it comes to personalized medicine and rare disease. Every federal dollar we put into research today paves the way for the cutting edge diagnostics, treatments, and cures of tomorrow. On that front, we've made some progress. Last year, Congress secured a significant funding boost for the NIH for the ninth year in a row. This year, we're doing everything we can in the Senate to protect those funding gains, despite some calls over in the House, not saying who, to cut the NIH budget. Not only is research funding the right thing to do, but we know for every dollar of NIH funding, approximately $2.64 of, that sounds like someone with a Wharton degree, of economic activity is generated throughout the U.S. Number two, giving patients and their families a better seat at the table during the treatment approval process. As you know, patients are a valuable source of information that are the true north, we like that phrase in Minnesota, for drug developers, scientists, and physicians. That's why I'm fighting, along with the other rare disease congressional caucus co-chairs, to reform the way the FDA works with rare disease patients, and I'm currently pushing the agency to improve its review process for new rare disease therapies. As alums of one of the world's top business schools, you know better than most that collaboration fosters innovation. By improving transparency and cutting through red tape, we can get life-changing treatments approved without unnecessary delay. That brings us to number three, 
supporting those that who are living with rare diseases. This is especially important for kids because as you know, 70% of rare genetic conditions start in early childhood. We've made strides toward empowering the families of babies born with rare diseases to start treatment as soon as possible. Sometimes if it's not diagnosed, you're never gonna qualify for the treatment. In Minnesota, we offer one of the most comprehensive newborn screening programs in the country. I wanna make sure every state has the resources they need to follow our lead, because that early detection and diagnosis can mean the difference between your child being approved to receive a treatment or not. But we still have work to do. That's why I'm leading the bipartisan bill to ensure that rare cancer patients can access molecular diagnostic testing one of our most powerful tools for treating rare cancers at their initial diagnosis. So between funding cutting edge federal research, reforming the FDA approval process for rare disease therapies, and improving access to care for children with rare diseases, we have just a few things on our plate. But you're Wharton alumni. You brought the world everything from Boston Scientific to CBS. Working together, I know we can develop treatments and cures and save lives. Before I go, I wanna share some words of wisdom from Abby Hauser, a young woman in Minnesota living with a rare disease that causes symptoms like chronic pain and frequent bruising. Her condition hasn't stopped her from thriving. She's even a marathon runner. After finishing the Chicago Marathon, she said this, I hope anyone who sees me run sees a world of capabilities the next time they see a person with a disability. Everyone has the right to chase their dreams no matter the size or how it's accomplished. All it takes is some relentless forward progress and the guts to dare greatly. Abby inspires me to dare greatly, to dare to envision a future without rare diseases. And thanks to you, I know that future is possible. Keep up the great work. Thanks everyone. And thank you to Senator Klobuchar and her staff. We were super excited to have her join us today. Uh, she is the co-chair of the Rare Disease Caucus in the Senate, and she's been extremely active. I, I can testify as um, a person who has done rare disease advocacy. She's been extremely um, accessible to rare disease patients and, and very active. So we're so thrilled that she could join us today. And um, it, it, it was kind of funny, my colleague and I, when we first watched her remarks, uh, we learned things about Wharton that we didn't know. So. It was very well researched, so thank you so much. Uh, so um, well, I'd like to introduce today the our two guests, um, bio biopharmaceutical executive Justin Ham, and uh, who is joining us from Seoul, Korea, and uh, Leslie Edwin, who is joining us from Atlanta, Georgia. Um, Justin is the uh, Justin is an executive who has done his entire career with rare disease research, um, and excuse me, with rare disease. Um, please, Justin, would you like to introduce yourself? Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Justin. Uh, actually, you know, my last name is spelled H-A-F, but um, it's uh, supposed to be pronounced as Ham, not Ham. <laughs> but anyways, um, I'm class of 2006. I majored in healthcare management uh, at Wharton. And um, I'm a pharmacist by training, and um, I, I started as a research scientist and then worked for a big pharma uh, like Eli Lilly and Celgene. And I also led a Korean biotech um, as a CEO uh, before uh, my current role, which is a country manager for Medicine Pharma, which is a global company to uh, bring innovative rare disease drugs to patients in Korea. So uh, I'm honored to participate in this event and well, uh, look forward to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. Uh, Leslie, I'd like to introduce you as the president of the Cushing Support and Research Foundation. Thank you. Happy Rare Disease Day, Amy. Thank you to you as well. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is Leslie Edwin. I was diagnosed with Cushing's disease, which is a rare endocrine disorder caused by a pituitary tumor uh, back in 2012. I uh, didn't know exactly where the pituitary was. I didn't know a whole bunch about the endocrine system. So it was a very life altering experience. Um, come to find out it's pretty much like that for all of us. There's delays to diagnosis. Um, 
it's a very compelling space to get into when you've dealt with it. And then it kind of keeps lingering and you kind of can't get back with your life. So you start looking for ways to volunteer. So that's kind of how I got involved with uh, Cushing Support and Research Foundation. I uh, started volunteering a couple of years after I was a little bit better and um, became the president in 2018. Um, we got a lot going on and I'm sure some of that will come out on the call, but uh, thank you for inviting me. Really a uh, pleasure to be here today. Thank you so much. Um, so we're both thrilled that you're here, um, Justin and Leslie, thank you. And, uh, you know, we may wonder how did this event come about um, to celebrate National Rare Disease Day? Almost a year ago, Justin and I were introduced by our mutual friend and classmate and fellow WASIC board member, or at least Elise Bernal. And I enjoyed my conversation with Justin so much, I wanted to replicate it for a larger audience. Um, you know, working in rare disease is often a labor of love, but as a Wharton alum, it has often struck me that there is great value and opportunity into coming into the sector as well. And so this, uh, this session is a love letter to two people whose careers have been, I would say, dedicated to, but Justin took exception to that. So I would say shaped by rare disease. And um, Justin and, and Leslie represent two different sets of stakeholders in the rare disease community, uh, pharma and, and patients and patient advocacy. But at the, common, at, you know, at, at the core, there's this common goal of treating rare disease. Um, so we all want the same thing. We're all driving towards the same goal. And I wanted to explore why they do this and what's the value in be, being involved in the rare disease market and what opportunities can it present um, to two different stakeholders. So um, Justin, I'd like to start with you. Uh, I, you know, I've always been curious for people who do enter the rare disease space, why did you enter? Why did you enter into rare disease? Um, I, I think it started with my uh, personal uh, experience of losing my younger brother when I was uh, 13 and he was 11. Um, so it was like almost 40 years ago <laughs> from now. Um, but but um, he died um, due to quite a rare condition. Um, and well, after that, uh, I, I think I started to, you know, uh, develop this interest and, and, and you know, helping rare disease uh, patients, especially little children. So, so I started to volunteer for an organization called the Korean Organization for Rare Disease, KORD, which is, I think, equivalent to NORD in the U.S. Uh, but at that time, you know, this organization was at a at an infant stage. So, um, well, I I helped the, the parents of these rare disease uh, children, um, and then well, gradually, you know, I started to uh, you know further develop my passion toward it. So I, I ended up going to pharmacy school and also you know uh, majored in pharmaceutical science. So my first job out of college was to work as a research scientist. Um, hoping that I can get, you know, uh, involved in, in some new drug discovery, et cetera. Um, and since then on, yeah, I, I realized that uh, I'm not a good scientist material. So I started, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, my, my MBA instead of my PhD, uh, which was original plan. And then after that, like I said earlier, you know, I, I worked for Eli Lilly and Celgin and then, you know, gained a lot of experience there uh, in many different functions. And then uh, um, well, I took the opportunity to lead a biotech company in Korea as the CEO, um, which was a very exciting journey. But um, well, the, the things are not quite favorable nowadays for biotechs. So, so uh, recently I decided to you know, uh, uh, join uh, my newest company, uh, which is really dedicated to you know, help uh, rare disease patients. Uh, um, so yeah, well, that's uh, kind of my you know motivation <laughs> and then a story you know about rare disease uh, in my career. That's extremely touching. Thank you so much. And um, Leslie, you know, it's it's one thing to be a patient of a rare disease, but it's something else to to dedicate um, your career to becoming literally the the face of rare disease and the leading advocate as the, for example, as the president of the Cushing Support and Research Foundation. Um, why did you decide to become an advocate and what's how, you know, what is your journey? Goodness. Um, I, I've always had, I've always volunteered for more than one thing, even working full time. I still have a thing or two happening on the side. So um, I had given birth a couple few years before I started getting really sick. So I was still kind of on an extended maternity leave and doing a lot of volunteer work. 
uh, when I got sick, even that had to come off my schedule. It was just too much to do anything once you're really, really sick. As you know, you just don't want to even leave the house sometimes. But uh, in recovery, it just seemed the days just go so slowly. Um, and I felt my my mind coming back and some of my capabilities and it just felt frustrated. So I wanted to uh, contribute. And um, I only found CSRF after my uh, surgeries. Like I really wish I'd found it before, but I just was, I, I guess I was looking for other things. But um, when I did, I reached out to Louise Pace, our founder, and she answered the phone <laughs> just right away, I called the number on the website. And we try to do that still to this day because that was very impactful for me just to have a person answer that phone. So we were on the phone probably two hours and she just told me kind of her, her history. And it, she started the uh, organization in 1995 um, similar situation. She was in recovery and trying to uh, find others to talk to or anything, and there just kind of wasn't much. Nord, <laughs> the National Organization of Rare Disorders here in the United States, um, put her in touch with a couple other patients that had reached out to them as well. Um, so they kind of started CSRF. Um, they started trying to get in touch with other patients. So uh, she built it with a medical advisory board, um, had meetings every other year. I just felt like this is a, a place I want to put some of my, you know, my volunteer energy because it just seemed like, it seemed like the only place I could find. I don't know. Uh, there's not a whole bunch of like really great big organizations with, with far reach. Um, so I started volunteering in 2014, uh, helping to organize support groups and then started going to conferences. And that was really important for me to see the kind of education doctors are getting because if you're if you stay in the social media realm and only talk to patients, you're going to get a much different uh, point of view uh, or just an impression of the way things are going. But to be in this professional space, um, hearing the innovations, uh, the just everything that the doctors are attending and researchers are are creating, and that was even in 2015, I think, when I went to my first endocrine society conference. So since then, I mean, that was that was like kind of encouragement to keep going and and do more uh, with CSRF because I started getting really fascinated and really interested in the science and the research and trying to figure out what all these words meant because I do not have a medical background. Um, my background's in financial services and culinary. <laughs> so uh, I had a lot to learn. Um, even like, yeah, it's just been a really great learning experience for me. And so when the original team had been at it for almost 20 years, they needed to step down. I kind of just became president because I was there and I was maybe the most active and in a position where I could do it. Um, and it was overwhelming the thought um, of doing that because CSRF is uh, regarded in most cases I've never heard otherwise and I'm not trying to toot our horn but um, we've done the work and I guess we deserve it but we're we're known as an, one of the the biggest um, international Cushing's support organization um, in globally internationally <laughs> so uh, that's about that's a lot of it. that's a, those are massive shoes um, and I've been trying to build a team a strong team of involved volunteers making sure our medical advisory board is is engaged and the top of their game um and just if you the 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 number of good people that you have with you it's going to be a better outcome so i feel like we're we're making some moves now um that just built on the base of 20 good years of building this organization from three patients and a typewriter you know in 1995 to what we are today so uh i kind of just sort of showed up <laughs> it wasn't <laughs> but i've stayed because it's just so so valuable for me yeah well, I'd say it was definitely uh, an incident of where preparation meets opportunity. So yeah, yeah. And yeah. I, I would agree CSRF does great work and they've helped thousands of people and literally saved lives. So thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Justin, so I'm curious from a market perspective, you know, what are some of the trends with rare disease drug development you've witnessed over the span of your career? Um, and then what are some of the challenges regarding access internationally and domestically? Um, so when I first started uh, as a research scientist out of school, uh, it was uh, uh, in 1990s, and at that time, um, well, if I'm not mistaken, you know, the, the uh, percentage of uh, rare disease drug out of all FDA, you know, approved drugs was uh, like, you know, somewhere around 20%. So I thought, you know, 
companies should uh, pay more attention to uh, this uh, rare disease uh, where you know there is a huge uh, medical needs. Um, but but um, over time, I think uh, that percentage started to go up because when I you know check back uh, the statistics, it looks like uh, that percentage you know became uh, thirty plus percentage in, in two two thousand. In 2010, it was uh, almost 40 percent, and uh, you know last year, the, the actually more than half of US FDA approved the drugs were for the rare disease. So I think you know it's quite promising and positive uh, trend. Uh, but but um, at the same time, I started to realize that you know even though a lot of new drugs are being developed, uh, the access to those drugs uh, are still remaining as a big challenge, especially in the international markets. Because you know, at the end of the day, somebody has to pay for that, and you know, when when the number of patients are very small, obviously, you know, you know, the the the, the price point uh, should be higher, uh, and then that creates a lot of issues and challenges. Uh, um, especially, you know, if the payer is the government, then you know, it requires a lot of you know negotiation between the pharma company and the government. And oftentimes, you know, it doesn't go uh, as smooth as you can wish. Um, and then, well, I've, I've uh, actually, you know, uh, uh, gone through a lot of uh, uh, negotiation with the Korean government when I was heading up the market access team uh, at Billy. Uh, and and I, I, I really you know, wanted to uh, address um, those uh, situations, you know, doing something to contribute. <laughs> because, you know, patients nowadays, you know, they are very well informed about, you know, which new drugs are developed where. Um, so, you know, the day when the new drug is approved by US FDA, you know, real time, you know, people, patients in Korea know, and they ask, start asking about, okay, when can I get that drug for me or for my you know, children? But unfortunately, um, seven, eight out of 10 drugs, you know, may not eventually reach Korean patients. Um, um, so yeah, that that's a that's a, a big issue, you know. Um, so yeah, I think there are positive and negative trends, you know, happening at the same time. <laughs> I, I agree with you. Uh, access is a huge one, and you know, when uh -huh. you're on the receiving end of it, it's everything, right? Right. Uh, but I would I agree with you. This uh, the sense of like the democratization of information for the patient has been huge. You know, not just Doctor Google, but access to different studies and just knowledge of kind of what's uh, what's percolating within the R&D sector is much more accessible to patients now. So, um, and, and to others and to other stakeholders. So thank you so much for highlighting that. Um, Leslie, from a patient perspective, what are the business opportunities in the rare disease space? Things we hear over and over again is, uh, I think more often than not, uh, treatments for after surgery. Um, one big one, uh, a lot of patients end up with adrenal insufficiency, either temporary or permanent after surgery. I mean, uh, the, the rate of recurrence for Cushing's um, can reach up to 50%, depending on how far out you track a patient. So that's uh, a little a little bothersome, but uh, the the risks of adrenal insufficiency and other conditions afterwards really leads to a need for um, devices um, and other therapies that can contribute to quality of life and enable patients to administer and manage their their illnesses. So, just as one example, uh, the adrenal uh, adrenal insufficiency community has just needed a, a, a continuous cortisol pump forever <laughs> and a more auto autonomous and a more automatic uh, emergency injection. Right now, if a patient starts to have a, a crisis, uh, they're usually confused, unable to really focus. They have low blood pressure, they're shaking. They need to find their vial. They need to find a little you know, jar of juice. Uh, they need to you know, fill the, the needle. They need to do all these steps and then also inject themselves uh, so, um, EpiPen, <laughs> uh, there's, there's a lot of room for something like that. And also the continuous cortisol monitor. I was in, uh, Argentina last year and met a patient who is one of the very few in the world who has a doctor, of course, she doesn't live in the United States, um, who has a doctor who is, um, who reconfigured, I think a pump, uh, an insulin pump to continuously monitor her cortisol. She showed me there's an app attached to it so she can continuously see what her cortisol is. 
I mean, she's got very badly managed adrenal insufficiency. Without that, she would most likely not have been there. Um, but that device, how many lives could that save? You know, uh, and those are like the two glaring, like really good examples of kind of a device. We have several FDA approved medications and that's, we're light years ahead of some rare diseases that have none. And some rare disease groups are starting a, a patient registry just so they can find enough people and collect enough data to try to encourage a, a pharmaceutical company to pursue a drug. Um, whereas we have four, five, six, we have a couple in late stage that have been looking really good in clinical trials, probably will be available within the next few years. Um, I think with the issue with the drugs, it would be access. And I'm, I don't want to just like ramble on here because I think we'll like talk about that a little bit more, but just like what Justin was talking about, seven out of 10 drugs might not reach Korea. These FDA approved drugs here, um, because of the way our insurance and payer issues work and pricing and R&D, like you see a sticker price, but no patient pays that. But you, these companies can't go maybe to Korea, for example, and try to market that drug at that price because with the single payer, this is my understanding. I'm still learning more about how this works, but uh, we just talked to a lot of patients and they're like, we can't access any of those drugs. If they can access any of them, it might be one or two of the generics that have been around for decades for, you know, that are repurposed because they happen to control cortisol a little bit. Um, so that those are just a few examples. Um, there's more. <laughs> there's a lot of ways, a lot of things, to, especially to do with quality of life and all the, the remnants of uh, what Cushing's does to your body, you know, after you're supposedly in remission or long-term long-term uh, outcomes, there's a lot of work that could be done there because a lot of us don't know how to uh, how to correctly treat because we think we're done with Cushing's and it's just that's that's never that's never the case. So uh, there's lots of room for investment, I would say. <laughs> uh, thank you. Yeah, I mean, whenever we go to different conferences, we hear that there's literally billions of dollars in market value mm -hmm. is at stake at rare disease. Um, one in 10 Americans are impacted somehow by rare disease. And yet it's somehow, um, I, I do think there's an increasing focus on it, but it is one of these sectors that, you know, is, is super, it's emergingly, it's heating up and I think it's getting hotter and hotter. And there is an increasing focus on it. Uh, Justin, like you were saying, there does seem to be an increase in the, uh, the percentage of drugs that are coming out for rare disease. So I, th I think that there is this kind of slow boil, which is super exciting. Um, and you know, which we all want to be a part of. So thank you, Leslie. Um, Justin, what um I wanted to um switch switch a little bit because we talked about and when we had our pre-discussion, we talked a little bit about what does uh, about like you know, in terms of access, clinical trials, like what sort of um where does that come into play? And you made this really intriguing point, which I wanted to explore. What role does diversity in clinical trials play? Like, why is that important, especially in the rare disease sector? Um, well, from the pharma uh, you know, point of view, making sure that um, diversity is uh, appropriately reflected in the clinical trial design is extremely important because, uh, well, you know, not all drugs, you know, work in the same way, you know, for different, different, you know, ethnic groups, uh, because, you know, you know, everyone has, uh, you know, <laughs> different type of genes and, you know, that makes the reaction to, you know, to drugs, you know, different. So what that means is uh, um, global companies oftentimes has to, you know, conduct a global clinical trial, making sure that, you know, different uh, uh, ethnic groups are, are properly reflected in this clinical trial so that, you know, if the drug is, uh, even if the drug is, uh, you know, uh, developed in the U.S., for example, when they, you know, come to Korea, you know, for drug approval, um, you know, local authority almost always, you know, ask, okay, um, you know, these data are for the Americans or, you know, white people. Um, about Korean patients or at least in you know, Asian patients because uh, we we cannot you know guarantee that it will work in the same way for Korean patients um, so so um, you know almost always you know we need to generate those data um, 
So yeah, well, I, I, I'm not sure whether I'm answering your question accurately, right. but, but um, um, it is important, um, not just for the ethical issue, but also you know, from the business point of view, company needs to make sure that you know, this diversity is uh, uh, properly reflected in the trial design. Thank you. So um, Leslie, from a patient perspective, what, how do you view the relationship between pharmaceuticals and patients? Like how, how, do people, how can these stakeholders work together to, and, and cooperate to get better results? Well, it just so happens, I have some really great examples. <laughs> um, we have, uh, through working with Nord and other groups, um, seen modeled uh, the, uh, a corporate council, which is a, a way for a rare disease uh, group to connect with pharma, not for voting purposes, but to have everyone at the table. Uh, in the past, we uh, applied for grants for various activities. We would apply for a grant with one, apply for a grant with one. Every time we'd have a conversation with one, we'd have to have that same. It was like all very separate. Um, and there was some question like, is this something that we can even do? Bring them all together, talk to them all in one space ask them to support the organization on a regular basis. Um, and so I think because of the nature of Cushing's, the likelihood that cortisol and uh, high cortisol dysregulated is probably gonna end up really not being all that rare at all. Um, I believe endogenous sources will remain that way, meaning from a tumor, but uh, I think, I mean, I would, I would theorize that's why we have even one FDA approved drug because these, they're, pharma is not a bunch of business guys sitting there figuring stuff out. It starts with a scientist, you know, a scientific group. And so uh, I think they understand like the, the, the impact of cortisol on the body. So uh, there are, our community has a lot of opportunities given to them uh, or offered to them, sorry, by the pharmaceutical companies that make the drugs for us. They're curious about the patient voice. They're curious about uh, patient behaviors and beliefs about uh, certain types of therapies. Um, we have acted as a third party recruiter for a lot of boards for them to listen to patients share their story and answer questions. There's no sales pressure or anything like that. They just wanna learn. And they, they have understood even before I've seen it listed in NORD or FDA manuals, you know, that it's really important to have the patient involvement on all levels of the development of clinical trials, of marketing materials, of just understanding how the drug, I mean, how the, the disease goes in the first place. So I think if there isn't a connection and there happens to be a pharmaceutical company out there, um, it probably just pays just to go for it because they, they really need it. And I think actually FDA is requiring or strongly suggesting some sort of connection with a patient adv uh, uh, advocacy group and a patient panel of some sort as they develop new drugs for rare diseases. I don't know if it's all disease states, but definitely with rare diseases because FDA is you know, making some changes and stuff. Um, as far as, I don't know if we're ever gonna beat the whole big pharma boogeyman um, stereotype and because it exists for a reason, you know, uh, it really does. But then when it comes to rare diseases, do we want drugs to help us you know, control our cortisol if we can't have a surgery or we can't find the tumor or, we're a little bit older and our tumor's small and we just don't want to go through a surgery. Like there's millions of reasons why having a medication is a really good thing to have alongside surgery and radiation. So yes, this is something that we need and we need to help them get it right. Uh, it's not, we're not like, you know, doing their work for them or anything like that. It's just, I, I think that giving, I don't know, suspending the the big pharma conspiracy thinking uh, when it comes to rare diseases, especially if you can form a connection with those companies and talk to them on a human level and find out like, what's your pipeline? Where did your concept come from? Who is the scientist that kind of came up with this? Where, you know, what were you thinking with this? What do you think about cortisol? I try to have that conversation with them all the time that I talk to them. Uh, but they've also, uh, beef, I believe, directly from working with us, um, ours anyway, is that they have developed like patient ambassador programs. They've got two or three patients who are taking their medication who have agreed to be an ambassador for any other patient that starts the med or is thinking about taking the med to talk to a patient who's actually on it right now and get some just real talk. Yes, they're paid some amount of money, but not like it's not a job. They're doing it for the benefit of the patient. Um, and they have really caring patient groups. You know, they understand how important it is, especially for Cushing's, um, to support the patients because this disease gets really gnarly. That's an official word. I looked it up, it's scientific. Um, just to have all the, you know, multiple sources of, of education and support 
even if one of them is pharma, you know, you look at the price tag, you think, oh, it's just the same old thing. But again, they all have copay programs because they understand how important it is that these patients get access to it, even though there's a very small population, ultimately it's going to take it. And most of them aren't going to take it for life. You know, like you got to wonder why would a company, those are, those are weird parameters for a company to agree to develop a, a medication for. So I think it's, I think it's worth suspending that, you know, the, the, the pharma, the pharma, whatever that is, I can't think of the word, but uh, in the case of rare diseases and communicate and find out where there is room for collaboration to educate, and make sure they're making a good product for your, for your um, community. I agree. Uh, yeah. that, that makes, I completely agree. And I mean, Justin, from your perspective as, as someone who's in the pharmaceutical industry, I mean, how, how do you, in Korea, how do patient support groups and advocacy groups, uh, what's the relationship with the patient groups and, and uh, pharma, for example? And, and how can we cooperate more to bring together the desired outcomes that we seek? Well, if we are talking about Korea specific uh, context, uh, I think we have to you know, understand that um, you know, even big farmers, uh, they do not have you know, R&D centers, for example, in Korea. Mm -hmm. So most of the activities done by uh, you know, global pharma companies in Korea is, you know, to register truck um, and you know get the you know reimbursement and then you know commercialize it uh, so to speak. Um, so so our, our engagement with the patient advocacy group is also along uh, that you know value chain. Um, so you know when we go to MOH for example you know to to get the drug approval um, or when we go to you know a government national payer or for the reimbursement of the drug. Um, well, obviously the pharma company wants to, you know, have the registration and reimbursement, but, um, you know, it's, it's the same with the patients and more so with the patients, right? So, so I think because of that, you know, there is a very active uh, collaboration engagement, you know, between pharma company and patient advocacy group, uh, you know, at the local country level. Um, but, but yeah, sometimes, you know, um, Sometimes uh, pharma companies are also uh, criticized or, yeah, or I, I cannot find the right word, but, but um, you know, <laughs> patients want uh, pharma companies to try harder um, to make sure that, you know, that the drug can be really you know, accessible to patients uh, uh, because oftentimes, again, you know, it, you know, uh, boils down to the price level and if the government and the company cannot really agree upon the you know appropriate price level, then you know during that period when the drug cannot be accessed, you know it's only patients who really you know suffer from that consequence. So I think from that regard, you know patient organization you know uh, give a constructive uh, challenge and feedback to pharma companies uh, as well. Um, so yeah, I, I, I have been working with uh, many different disease groups in Korea, but most of the time, I think it is much more favorable than my experience when I was you know, briefly working in the US. Um, I, when I first heard about the you know, very bad public reputation of the pharma industry for US Americans, I was almost shocked. <laughs> what? <laughs> because of some statistics that showed that you know, pharma, uh, reputation is almost, you know, on par with the tobacco company. And I was like, <laughs> oh my gosh, you know, how could that be? Because uh, because a lot of people, you know, working in this industry are genuinely, you know, caring about, you know, about the patients and, and about the, this, you know, noble mission that we are, you know, working on. So I think it's a bit, uh, you know, unfortunate and sad to see that, you know, a lot of people, you know, really, you know, sometimes I see pharma only as a bad guy, you know, big fat, you know, bad guy, uh, which is not the case, um, maybe for some, but but not necessarily everyone. Um, yeah, let me stop here. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I, I know I appreciate you both kind of addressing that head on that there is a lot of, especially in the rare disease community patient community, there is some suspicion and I, I would even say kind of hostility in terms of motivations of the drug companies and while there's still this interdependence 
um, you know, pharma, like pharma needs patients and patients need pharma. And it's, it's really a matter of clear communication. And that's one of the reasons why we wanted to create this fireside chat today was to kind of help break down these barriers and facilitate these sorts of communication. And I, I mean, I, I know I've, I've learned a lot uh, in our discussions with, with both of you um, in terms of how we can cooperate more together and what some of the challenges, for example, you know, I'm very familiar with the challenges to the patients, but what some of the challenges on the pharmaceutical end are. So thank you so much. Um, we're at the point now where I'd like to open it up for questions. If, um, if anyone would like to submit a question, um, we definitely welcome it. In the meantime, I, I have a question for Leslie. Um, yeah, please feel free to put the questions in the chat or in the, in the Q and A. Um, you know, Leslie, I, you, you kind of touched on it, but what is the value that the patient brings to this process? Like I, I've actually sat at round tables and heard pharmaceutical reps you know, kind of, or, or company reps kind of discount wanting to get the patient involved in the process. And that's clearly not how everyone feels. I mean, Justin, you clearly feel that uh, the patient should be included, but, you know, Leslie, what, what do you think the the patient, you know, what's the value of including the patients in the, in the development process and in the treatment process? The question for Justin, let me think here. <laughs> um, so from Justin, my point of view, okay. well, well, I was trying to tell, <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. They get to buy more time. You think about it. <laughs> yeah, um, do you want to answer that first? Do you want to take a swing at it? I was not listening. <laughs> I can so, I can answer it. She said, what's okay. the value of I'll come back to you, Justin? Oh, I've got a Cushing spray. Hold on. What is the value of patient involvement for the pharmaceutical company in the value chain or in certain elements of, of the value chain? Yeah. So my answer would be uh, that, especially with Cushing's, I'll just use that because that's my best example. Um, there's so many unique elements to what uh, patients are going through. There's a lot of symptoms. It's full, it's full system because you have cortisol receptors in basically all of your tissues. And so we're going through a lot. Uh, we have different thought, the way that it's affecting us and limiting our life, it's affecting our job, it's affecting it affects ways that we can get to a clinical trial. For example, it can affect like our religion might affect which choices we make in certain medications. Um, heavy social media use can, can sway somebody. How valuable is that? Like patients can answer a lot of questions that the pharmaceutical companies might be wondering about how, how is this drug going to be received by this company? You know, they, or by this community, uh, if I tell them that they this is a shot they have to take four times a day, is this something that a patient who is just exhausted all the time is gonna remember to do or is in pain? Like what if there's like a pain, like just finding out what are the, the small elements of it and what kind of support are they going to need? Do they need a patient team, a patient care team at the pharma company that checks with them once a month to make sure they're taking their meds? You know, uh, is this a, you know, is this a community that has to take a lot of medications while they're ill? A lot of medications when they're done being ill, you know, like what are really, because if you talk to a doctor, if you just look at some, some basic manual, a lot of this quality of life and the, the, the nitty gritty of, of really what, what it feels like and what it is like to have Cushing's, uh, you're not going to get that in current research unless you look at our research, you know, uh, it's just not, I mean, you've got some basic stuff, you've got some basic symptoms, you've got like the test and the, the rate of accuracy and you know, some of the understanding uh, with the Cushing's QOL validated questionnaire, for example, they can learn some stuff, but uh, really just getting the experts, which is us, um, patients, to ask them all those questions because we open up. If you ask us, we open up. We'll tell you everything plus some, you know, and that's invaluable. How they're not going to get that anywhere else. They cannot find that anywhere else. We all mute. Thank you. Amy. Fundamentally, I, I agree. Um, if you, if, if a drug is developed and it doesn't address the basic needs of the patient, then what's the point, right? So mm -hmm. the patients really are patient feedback and patient lived experience, uh, is extremely valuable from start to finish. Um, we received a question from a woman named, uh, Ada Leo, and she's a Wharton MBA 2018. Um, she said that her 19 month old was diagnosed with a very rare disease, uh, called ZTTK last year. And uh, they just started drug development in Boston, working with other companies and um, scientists as part of her small nonprofit. 
And the ZTTK uh, community is very international. For example, the basic researcher is, is from South Korea. And um, she said she loved Justin's perspective on working internationally and wanted to get more advice on how to engage international patients. And Ada, of course, we'd, we would um, be delighted to, to connect with you um, afterwards. Thank you. So Justin, what, from your perspective on working internationally, uh, what's, the, what's your advice to engage on international patients? And then Leslie, I'd like you to round that as well. Weigh in. So maybe um, I need to understand the, the question more clearly before answering that. Is it, is it about the clinical trial or is it about, you know, some other uh, form of uh, collaboration? Are you? I, I think she means both. Like, so yeah, how, how to, um, how to get connected to other patients internationally, especially for like really, um, for very small communities, like in the United States, how, how does, how can you reach out and connect with patients that are worldwide? Well, um, First of all, <laughs> I'm not quite experienced in 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 that area. Um, mm -hmm. I have to disclaim. Um, but but um, well, she wanted I to that, uh, mm -hmm. both enrolling yeah. the patients in the data collection efforts and understanding their priorities. So you know, I'd like you to kind of weigh in on that, Justin, and then um, if if you if you want, and then we'll ask Leslie as well. Yeah, well, um, if you are talking about clinical trial, again, you know, the clinical tri trial design is, you know, made by the, you know, uh, clinical team in the usually corporate headquarter level. And um, I think, you know, nowadays, uh, most of the time, uh, um, companies uh, understand, you know, what needs to be done in terms of recruiting, you know, patients globally. Uh, Etc. But but um, well, when it comes to uh, this uh, rare disease, you know, where the number of patients are really small, it is difficult uh, to you know to recruit <laughs> from many different countries or or you know different different uh, ethnic groups. Uh, and then and, and well, because of that, you know, if the drug is developed without, let's say, you know, uh, any Asian population in it, um, well. If the drug is designated as orphan drug, um, you know, bringing it in into international market like Korea, uh, they don't necessarily, you know, ask for Korean patients in that trial because you know the authorities also understand that you know there are extremely small number of patients, uh, so you know they treat you know rare disease uh, a bit differently from that regard, you know, than other disease like hypertension, diabetes, where, you know, there can be tens of thousand patients. Uh, and then, you know, in that case, you have to make sure that all different uh, ethnic groups uh, uh, can be reflected uh, in the design. But but I think when it comes to rare disease with really small number of patients, uh, it's, it, it'll be treated differently. Uh, but still, you know, it is worthwhile if you can find, you know, patients from other countries um, to include them. Um, but, but yeah, well, I, I think I have to, you know, try not to answer some <laughs> something that I don't really feel I can, I have the expertise with. Maybe uh, Leslie, you can provide more from the patient advocacy. Somehow I actually <laughs> can. I've been writing down. And I know I'm forgetting <laughs> some of them, but uh, so for us, it sounds like maybe you're doing uh, like a registry or a data collection, kind of like a registry. Right. Uh, we are currently... Yeah, rare X, sweet, um, sweet. Okay, so we are developing a registry right now too. Um, it's been years in the making. We had to convince everybody we could even do it in the first place. We have tons of patients here. So some of our challenges are not the same. There are some super rare, usually genetic diseases, and they are trying to form a registry just to find other patients in the world so that they can form enough of a cohort to entice anyone to do research, to help create a drug, to help repurpose a drug, anything like that. So uh, we, I can only speak, we are so lucky in so many ways. And one of those ways is I, it's easy for us to find what we need to find because there's so many people that have cortisol problems. <laughs> um, we are a member of a group called World Organization, I'm sorry, World Alliance of Pituitary Organization. Uh, yeah, WAPO. Um, so they 
have over the years been finding other pituitary related organizations. Some have to do with Cushing, some with acromegaly or the other pituitary conditions, but there's some, in some cases there might be a world collective, uh, something related. You might have a very specific disease with a very specific gene, but maybe one of the symptoms is something that there's a larger group. And if you connect with those groups, they might know a group, you know, in another country. We attended the WAPO meeting a couple of times. And through that, we've made connections in China, Mexico, Australia, other places I can't remember right now, Canada. Um, and so we just, we know where those guys are. And so through this registry, we're hoping to connect all those guys, you know, just anybody in the, in the world that needs the benefit of a registry without having any of the resources to do it. So we're in a different position, but uh, also in the United States, is this a uh, question asker in the United States? Uh, she's in Boston. Let's oh, guess. sweet. Okay. So uh, attending meetings by Global Genes, uh, by NORD, the National Organization for Rare Disorders. Uh, I can't remember the rest. That's what I was trying to come up with. Like other rare advocacy groups that have these meetings and some of them are just like advocacy focused or rare patient needs focused. But then there's people that come from other countries and you start to network and you talk to doctors that came from another country and then you just start finding people. Even if it's not your exact disease, they might know someone or it's associated. Uh, even the RDCA, the Rare Diseases Cures Accelerator that Critical Path Institute is doing with, uh, in conjunction with NORD and FDA, I think they're taking a bunch of de-identified rare disease info and putting it out there for everyone to access. I don't know, like not like you can just log on and just get it all, but um, I think they're trying to do something global like that too. So I'll just say exhaust all these resources. And if you need contacts for any of those, or there's more, and I just can't remember what they're called right now. Uh, that's how we've just picked up on so much. We've learned about registries and other patient groups, just everything has come from attending these conferences that are for us, not like going to the endocrine society. That's for us kind of, you know, we pick up stuff, but these are entirely for the advocacy group that's trying to do things for their patients, like the registry and, and new drug development and stuff like that. Thank you. Yeah, you're yeah. absolutely right. And just to build on that, um, one of the other resources available to rare disease patients and, and to pharmaceutical companies uh, is at the NIH. They have a rare disease hotline. Yeah, so definitely. there are people on staff, their entire jobs, taxpayer funded, uh, are to research questions and to find resources. So um, it may be something where um, Ada, you'd like to reach out. I suggest you reach out to the NIH to the, uh, the rare disease hotline. And I'm happy to provide that information for you. Uh, because they they have um, they can run queries and they can reach out to their resources um, and kind of help put the word out. So it you know which is extremely helpful. Uh, they have five thousand labs on site. They do a lot of rare disease work, and um, they're constantly working um, and and finding new information. So thank you so much for your question. And yes, we would definitely love to connect with you offline. Um, I one final question. Oh, two questions here. Okay, great. Um, so, um, with the, there's a question from Elise Bernal, and then we'll wrap it up after the second question. Um, what are some specific steps that patients can take to access new rare di th disease therapies or existing therapies that may be off label? Um, can communication with the biotech companies help, you know, reaching out directly? Uh, because some doctors seem reluctant to take chances with new treatments for their patients. Mm -hmm. um, so how can patients access these new rare disease therapies? and have the most options. Justin, <laughs> um, do you want me to answer that? Is it a question for me? <laughs> uh, well, if, if it can be if you would like, otherwise, I mean, would you like to take a swing at it, Leslie? I mean, yeah, I will. Sorry, either I one. just wanted either to pass, pass the football yeah, no, for a minute please. on that one. Um, yeah. So I remember back in, I think 2015, I went to a conference and oh, it was later than that because I was on the drug. I was after radiation, I took a medication to control my cortisol while I waited for the radiation to start working. And it was one that is sometimes controversial, whatever. It's a, it's a cortisol controlling medication that I chose because my doctor gave me all of my options, even the ones she didn't like clinical trials she wasn't sure about. She told me everything that was on the table. Um, not all doctors will do that. Like you mentioned, like uh, I talked to a, a doctor at this meeting that I'm, you know, the example I'm giving and someone asked him about this medication that I was taking at the time. He said, oh, I would never give my patients that medication because I don't like the way that you're supposed to 
you know, follow up with the patient. I can't test their cortisol. You know, I have to test other things and I'm just not comfortable with that. I was like, wow, like, you know, the medicine I chose myself looking at my life and how I wanted my med to work would have just never even been put on the table for me, um, for, uh, you know, with this other doctor. And so I will never forget that. Um, and, so we try to, I guess, uh, if there's a patient advocacy organization for your disease, you could reach out to them uh, to get more support about the drug. All of our uh, uh, FDA approved medications have an extensive patient team that can walk them through the diagnostic, or not the diagnostic, uh, the all the, the the process of getting approved for the med. They can reach out to the doctor and offer support to the doctor. Um, another option might be, I don't know if that, that can happen, depending on what your insurance is, that's definitely a privilege and access thing, but um, consulting with an expert doctor who does make all of those and possibly just asking or educating yourself about the medication that you really want, if you can even find out what it is, patient advocacy groups should always know what all the options are for patients for treatments, um, but that might not be something that you have for that, for that, uh, for that disease. Maybe connecting, yeah, I'd probably connect directly with the pharmaceutical company and see if there is anybody there. I'm trying to think like with no CSRF, with no nothing, and I'm going to the doctor and he says there's two meds available, but there's four out there. How am I going to find that out? Uh, I guess if I found it out, I would probably, I don't know, reach out to the pharmaceutical company. Especially mm -hmm. if, with rare diseases, I feel like those teams are more connected and open to being connected to the patient group because it's not just like a high blood pressure pill, you know, it doesn't matter. <laughs> There's millions of people who are going to take this, you know, it's just like, we don't need to be so inclusive and ready to, to take, to take questions about rare diseases. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And, and to build on that, um, sometimes there are kind of like waivers for, uh, to, to use as well. Um, mm -hmm. so I would, I would, and also pull through the protocols. Um, that's really important too. If there's a, a disease or excuse me, uh, a medicine that's being um, tested and you, you know, one way to access that would be to become involved in a actual study or a protocol. And um, that is something Clini that- Clinical it, trial? Is that what you mean? Clinical trial? Uh, protocol, protocol, clinical trial. Okay, yeah. sorry. No, it's okay. I'm sorry, at NIH, they call them studies or protocols. So okay. yeah, clinical trial. Um, and that's one way to have access to those medicines. So yeah. Um, yeah. That's uh, even more meta than a, a medication that a doctor doesn't understand. Like you want me to understand clinical trials too and be able to find them. But yeah, you're right. Uh, a lot of those clinical trials not only reimburse the patient for like travel expenses and stuff like that, but if they do well on it, they can enter an extension uh, study to just stay on that pill until they either have surgery or, you know, it goes uh, commercial. Um, a lot of people don't realize that. I think patient advocacy groups can do a good job, a better job, can do the job of helping patients under, fully understand what does it mean to enter a clinical trial. It took me years to really get it. Um, yeah, myself, I mean, it's so. a balance, but you know, fundamentally a rare disease patient's ability to access a drug shouldn't be reliant on an individual doctor's risk tolerance. Zero percent. Yeah, so um, we have one last question and this is from Kami. Um, She said, I'm impressed with the advancements, especially with medication for Cushing's. Uh, her, my sister, her sister has limb girdle muscular dystrophy and there are no medications yet. Uh, there needs to be government involvement too, as in my opinion, pharma will usually lean towards medicines that will result in profitability. How can we get government funding for more research and development into rare diseases? I, you know, that's an excellent question. Um, I, I, Justin, uh, Leslie, I'd like you both to, you know, it'd be very interesting to see your different perspectives on this. Well, I, I, I mentioned about the trend whereby uh, you know, the proportion of uh, rare disease drugs, you know, being approved by FDA has uh, uh, grown over time, you know, over the last few decades. Um, and then that was partly uh, driven by the government, you know, uh, uh, measures, uh, for example, uh, for orphan drug development, uh, I understand in the U.S., um, the government gives uh, uh, some you know, tax uh, uh, exemption on the money spent on R&D for rare disease. And also they give you know, additional uh, exclusivity for the drug in the market, et cetera. So, so those are the kind of incentives that actually helped, I think, um, to increase the number of you know, uh, uh, drugs um, or research you know, on, on rare disease. But, but um, 
I also do recognize that, you know, there are more than 7,000 um, identified rare disease. And then even if you develop, you know, 10, 20, 30 uh, new drug every year, you know, still there are you know, too many drugs uh, that still need uh, treatment. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, I agree that, you know, we need, you know, more research <laughs> done for rare disease, but um, yeah, it's not an easy problem to solve, to be honest. Um, <laughs> yeah, thank you. yeah, I hope. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a great response. Thank you so much. Uh, you're right. I mean, it's very fraught, and it's not easy. And that you know, it's these conversations that can help us lead to uh, joint solutions. So, thank you, Leslie. Did you want to weigh in? I do. <laughs> um, I know that the FDA has listening sessions, and this is obviously just for the U.S. Um, I forget what they're called, but I want to say it's PADUFA. It stands for something. I don't know. Um, it's up until now, it seemed kind of confusing for me specifically to figure out how to set that up, but I think it's in our future. Um, I know the acromegaly group or acromegaly community um, has done one successfully. They came out with a report and now the FDA knows a lot more about acromegaly and that could influence their guidelines for future clinical trials, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's one, because once there's more clinical trials and more funding and more understanding, uh, another one, hold on, I can't read my writing, is getting involved with legislative advocacy. I know that like Global Genes and some of those other groups uh, put together like Rare on the Hill, like World Orphan Drug Congress. Oh yeah, that's a great one. Going to the World Orphan Drug Congress, even just get a booth and set up like an info booth about your thing and don't let a single one of them pass by without talking to them about your community's needs. But um, you know, I, I digress, hold on legislative advocacy, right? If there's anybody creating a bill, sign on to it. If you've got a, lo a local legislator, go suggest it, keep bugging them. Like they need to look good. <laughs> they need to do things that their their constituents will wanna keep voting for them for, you know? Like they, I think the average is that they're one in 12 humans has a rare disease. You know one, you see one right now, you see two, maybe three, I don't know. Uh, like everyone knows someone that has a rare disease, whether you realize it or not, it's very common. You know, they're rare, but they're so common, like collectively. Uh, so everyone's affected. And sometimes, unfortunately, like here in the state of Georgia, uh, we had a Republican senator, or congressman, whatever, uh, who, uh, whatever, his policies didn't super align with mine. But then at some point he had a family member suddenly get diagnosed with a uh, serious rare disease. And then all of a sudden, guess who's the biggest advocate and guess who moved money and guess who got, you know, recognized by rare disease organizations for all their work. Um, so get them, get them where they have their feels um, and influence their policy. Uh, I had one more, sharing your story, forming a cohort of patients so that there's not just one or two, that there's a group if, if you don't already have one. Um, and somehow finding the funding, if you somehow, even, some people are really good at fundraising. Some people are just rich. I don't know, they just wanna give money away. Chan Zuckerberg, just just throw all the balls at the wall, like according to the time and the resources that you have, because there's so many things out there and you're going to get a bunch of no's, but even one good yes could just be what it takes to make everything start rolling. Yeah, and just connecting with the, the researchers who are doing any sort of related research and just, just form your community and just don't stop. <laughs> don't stop. Uh, yeah, I agree. Keep going. It, and you can see it within the rare disease community. There are um, communities that uh, are very powerful and it's because they're well politically organized. Um, and you know they make a, a point of really, um, and it's not just the patients, it's also the patient advocates, the caretakers, the family members, you know, the, the stakeholders in those patients' lives that really get involved and um, really try to make a contribution and try to uh, elevate their, their voice. Um, yeah, there was a, a one particular um, rare disease I'm familiar with that um, there was a family that decided they wanted to leave a legacy and they wanted to leave a profound, like, like a very directed, focused, concrete legacy in a very uh, specific way. And they, even though no one in the family had that particular illness, they chose that illness to really try to make uh, an impact with, and it worked, you know, it, they were able to fund a lot, uh, additional research and fund their efforts to go to the Hill. And so, um, also finding individual patrons is, is, you know, for, for philanthropy is, uh, is also a, a way to get, um, an increased, 
uh, focus and, and attention and resources on an illness as well. But generally speaking, I agree with Leslie joining um, the rare disease community and starting to mix with them, going to the lobbying events. It really makes a difference. Um, we've had I've had staffers tell me because I, I did it every year for several years in a row that the stories are really, really do make an impact. Um, you know, when people can put a face to a name and they're sitting in, in front of them and they can really, um, you know, things are tangible. It, it really does influence them when they're thinking about how to vote. Um, for example, uh, one year there was a, a $2 billion on the line for NIH and a whole contingent of us went to, um, to lobby. And it turns out that not only did they lose that funding, they received additional funding on top of it. So, you know, there are success stories and it does make a difference if you get involved in the democratic process and in the lobbying process. Um, you just have to put yourself out there and, and really participate and contribute. Um, so on that note, thank you so much to Justin and Leslie. I think this has been an extraordinary panel um, I or fireside chat, excuse me. Um, I, I know I've personally learned a lot and um, it's been really interesting uh, as a patient, especially to kind of see things from Justin's point of view, hear his story, mm -hmm. you know, kind of take a, a peek behind the pharmaceutical curtain, so to speak, um, with somebody who has spent his entire life with rare disease um, and for the most compelling of reasons um, and exploring the different market opportunities that are available with rare disease, exploring the, uh, you know, it, and it's not just a matter of, of dollars and cents. It's also the, what I kind of call the collective ROI. It's looking at the collective social good that comes from this. Um, it's not just you know, when you're involved with rare disease, you really do have a chance to make a difference in people's lives and to completely alter the trajectory of entire families. And that's extremely important. And, you know, Leslie, of course, uh, we've worked together for a very long time, and um, I have the utmost respect for the work that you do and the work we do together. And I am just thrilled that we were able to bring us all together and have this wonderful fireside chat. So thank you so much to you both. Happy National Rare Disease Day to everyone. And um, if you'd like to, please reach out. We're, we're happy to um, have some additional discussions offline. And thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Bye. Bye. Bye.